When you're building a culture of belonging, every word counts. That's why Textio brings the world's most advanced language insights into your hiring and employer brand content. Our industry-leading approach to artificial intelligence and machine learning provides the tools needed to find more diverse candidates. In short, Textio builds more equitable workspaces, guiding businesses and writing more inclusive job posts. And we're building on that success by bringing even more products to the market for all people who share our belief that language matters. Words have power. And at Textio, we harness that power to increase the access and availability of value-driven work for everyone. What's up, y'all? It's Zach with Living Corporate. And, you know, I continue to be amazed, thankful in this season. Um, If you haven't heard, Living Corporate just announced, unveiled, released. What's another good word? Unleashed. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) It's advisory board. And I just want to pause and say I'm really excited about the advisory board. I'm excited about these executives who come together to support Living Corporate's mission and vision as we continue to grow. You know, I've said in other spaces that like my dream is for Living Corporate to be like paramount, but of like black and brown experiences in the workplace, historically marginalized experiences in the workplace. And for that to happen, Living Corporate has to be more than you know, a couple folks in a room, right? It needs, it needs advisement. It needs more structure. It needs uh, consulting on how to scale and create global impact. And, you know, I've been exceedingly proud of what Living Corporate has been able to achieve since 2018. And I have visions of what Living Corporate can still be doing and where it needs to go. And for where it needs to go, we need more than what we're doing today. So all that being said, really excited. Shout out to Matamba Austin. Shout out to Liz Swagger. Shout out to Nisha Lomax. Shout out to the Kimberly Bryant. Shout out to Bianca Reed. And um, just shout out to the team. Like, I'm really excited. And, you know, when I think about living corporate and I think about like all the incredible relationships we've been able to build. I think a couple of weeks ago, I was talking about just thankful to people who are willing to give me a chance. You know, Howard Bryant is one of those people. Howard Bryant is a senior journalist uh, with ESPN and NPR. Frankly, one of the most like the the voice of, I'd say, like just of baseball journalism. And I know there's tons of people, but like he is one of the most prominent voices. And for good reason, he's been in this space for uh, more than a couple decades. I appreciate his work. I appreciate his objectivity. I appreciate his candor. And frankly, I just appreciate his willingness to come on Living Corporate and support independent black media. You know, I've been having like these points of frustration with young baby boomer and late Gen X black men. Um, But at the same time, like I have a really precious group of people in my life that are willing just to give Living Corporate space and time and give me space and time. Right. And I, I can't thank Howard enough. We not only talk about his latest book, which really got into the story and history of Ricky Henderson, one of the uh, baseball greats. But we also talk about some football, because if y'all don't know, I'm not a big NFL fan, but I'm a huge Lamar Jackson fan. So we talk about Lamar Jackson a bit. We talk about the through line of black athletes and advocating for your worth. And so I hope that you enjoy this conversation between myself and Howard Bryant. And uh, we'll be talking to you soon. All right. See you in a minute. Living Corporate is brought to you by Doximity. Doximity is committed to fostering an inclusive and diverse work environment where differences are valued, practices are equitable, and employees experience a sense of belonging that allows them to bring their full, authentic selves daily. As medicine's largest network, there's an elevated level of responsibility to everything we do. We don't take that responsibility lightly and are committed to working towards a more equitable world inside and beyond our virtual office walls. So if you want to learn more about Doximity, go to your app store and type in D-O-X-I-M-I-T-Y. Again, that's D-O-X-I-M-I-T-Y. This episode of Living Corporate is brought to you by Blind. 
Blind is a trusted community of more than 5 million verified professionals from startups to some of the largest companies in the world like Amazon, Deloitte, Ernst & Young, Goldman Sachs, Google, J.P. Morgan, Meta, and more. Blind's mission of transparency seeks to break down professional barriers and silos at work so that you can make productive change and advance your career. It's a safe space to ask questions and get the real-time insights and perspectives from people who know what you've been through. On Blind, you can connect and have honest discussions about everything from compensation, company culture, performance reviews, promotions, and more. You can also join your exclusive private company channel to chat with your coworkers about company policies and what's really going on at work. And because it's anonymous, you can be honest and trust what you read on Blind. Download and install Blind from the App Store or visit TeamBlind.com to get access to the latest salary, company reviews, and interview experiences thousands of companies worldwide. What's going on, Living Corporate? It's Tristan, and I want to thank you for tapping back in with me as I provide some tips and advice for professionals. Today, I want to discuss a few tips that can help with your productivity. We've all had those days where we're so productive that we get everything on our to-do list done and we feel unstoppable. But we've also had those days where we can't focus, can't get anything done, and we just hope no one notices. Those unproductive days may feel like they outweigh the productive ones. So I want to dive into a few tips that may help boost your productivity, no matter if it's pandemic induced or just going through that post lunch slump. First, I know this may sound like a crock of bull, but we need to reframe our mindset. Many of the issues we experience with productivity have to do with our inability to see the future or end result. So take a moment to envision what a productive day at work would look like for you and how you need to show up to make that happen. Also, take some time to evaluate the root cause of the issues you're having and think of some small incremental improvements you can make. Second, just get started on something small. Sometimes we're not productive because the tasks we need to complete seem huge and somewhat insurmountable. But if you can identify a small task and get that done, you can build up momentum that pushes you to the next task, and before you know it, you'll have your whole list completed. Third, clean your workspace. Our space can often impact our mood and productivity. If your space is cluttered, it can become easier for the mind to become distracted. Reconsider everything that is currently housed on your desk. If it doesn't belong there, then move it somewhere else. A great tip for this is to remove everything from your desk Clean your desk, consider everything you put back on it, and clean the commonly used items such as your keyboard, mouse, headphones, and desk mat before you put them back on. Fourth, step outside. Taking a quick walk can help re-energize you and get you ready to conquer your next task. You might even want to consider working outside if the weather is nice and you can. If you can't work outside or the outdoor spaces you have access to aren't very green, consider moving your desk near a window and buying some plants for your desk. Studies show that having plants in your workspace can help with your productivity. My last tip to help boost your productivity is to take a break. Sometimes we find ourselves in a slump because we aren't listening to our bodies. If you've been sitting at your desk trying to concentrate and have been unsuccessfully trying to get something done for the last two hours, step away from that task. Consider doing a quick meditation, checking in with a friend, or even taking a nap if you can. You weren't getting anything done anyway, so you might as well listen to your body and give it some time. This tip was brought to you by Tristan of Layfield Resume Consulting. Check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Layfield Resume, or connect with me, Tristan Layfield, on LinkedIn. Living Corporate is brought to you by Textio. Today's top talent is everywhere, representing everyone, and our work environment should reflect the level of inclusion to meet that standard. Textio achieves this in building more equitable company cultures through the language we use in our job postings. That culture is formed one hire at a time, making the words we use to reach more diverse candidates all the more important. Our advanced language insights and employer brand content is what drives our mission of inclusion. Through our industry-leading application of artificial intelligence and machine learning, we're able to widen companies' reach in finding and building upon the very diverse talent that empowers a culture of belonging. Every door should be open to every qualified job seeker. Again, that's Textio. Living Corporate is brought to you by Doximity. Doximity helps over 2 million medical professionals 
We are the largest medical network that includes over 80% of physicians and over 50% of physician assistants and nurse practitioners. We don't take that responsibility lightly and committed to working towards a more equitable world inside and beyond our virtual office walls. If you want to learn more about Doximity, check out your app store at D-O-X-I-M-I-T-Y. That's D-O-X-I-M-I-T-Y. Howard, welcome to the show. How you doing, man? Good, good. How about yourself? Man, listen, I'm all right. I'm all right. The first thing is, congrats on your latest book, Ricky, The Life and the Legend of an American Original. You've been writing for a while. So at this point, you know, it's, it's of course, it was received positive acclaim. Plenty of people are loving what they're, what they're reading. Talk to me about this particular book and, like, what compelled you to write this story and, and center on this man. Yeah, well, thank you for having me, Zach. It's good to see you again. I feel like um, every book is different. Every book catches you at a different time period, and it's sort of you feel like you're in a position to to take on a subject, right? Depending on what you know where you're at. And so, I think for me, I, I think that the biggest reason there's a lot of reasons for doing for having done the book. the The first one was 2014. Hank Aaron's 80th birthday. Uh, I met Ricky's wife, Pamela, and she saw Henry and me on stage. Uh, and we were doing a retrospective of the great man. And, and, and she is really dedicated to Ricky's greatness. She was dedicated to, you know, dedicated to Ricky, dedicated to, to, to making sure that people didn't forget everything that he did in the sport. And, you know, she had said something along the lines of, you know, I want you to do for for my husband what you did for Henry Aaron. And I'm like, I didn't do anything for Hank Aaron. Hank Aaron didn't need my help, but um, he's Hank Aaron. But I understood her point. Her point was, Ricky deserves this recognition. And that was 2014. And I hadn't really thought about it beyond that because it just didn't feel like a project for me at that time. I didn't see it. 2017, 2016, 2017 starts rolling around, you know, and I felt different. And still slowly two things were happening. I think the first thing that was happening was I was sort of looking for a new project. I knew this is what I wanted to do. And I started, you know, I was around with my friend, Pedro Gomez, the late, great Pedro Gomez from ESPN. And I remember we were at this bar in Arizona at spring training, and we were really talking about how many baseball people do you really believe, or even athletes in general, do you believe can carry a full biography, hitting those criteria that, you know, of of having import in the game at a top, top level, having import beyond the game, meaning are there different threads that you can talk about in American society through them? Where are the different strains where they can carry the narrative beyond what, beyond what you think the public generally knows about them? How much has been written about them in the past? Is it an original story? Is it a new story? And so you've got all these different bars that you have to meet. And then the second thing was, was, it was where the world was and where I was personally in 2016, 2017. So we're in the middle of the Kaepernick story. We're in the middle of kneeling. We're in the middle of Charlottesville, in the middle of protest. And, I, and I've been writing about this stuff, and I really just wasn't sure I could hear myself anymore. I, I felt like I was burning out. I don't know if that's the right term for it, but I sort of felt like... I need to go back to writing about some things that reminded me why I like the sport, why I like the games, why some, I need something enjoyable. Um, writing about more athletes getting blackballed and writing about another black kid that got shot in the back and, you know, by police and the, and, you know, people don't care. I was just losing my sense of myself. And so I felt it was important for me to, uh, to rediscover some of the things that I liked. And that was a, you know, that was a big deal for me. You know, there's so much um, in Rick and in Ricky Henderson's story that resonates with me uh, because he, f he drives this meta narrative of black men, black athletes, but then like more broadly, black men really asserting their own worth and pushing for their value. Um, even while white folks may push against that. Yeah, that was a big thing. They were really, when I did the Hank Aaron book in 2010, there were three major issues that I had with that book that I really knew that I had to confront. Um, 
And one of them was, I was born in 1968 and Henry Aaron was born in 1938. And so I wanted to make sure that it was possible for me to be respectful enough to write a story about a black man who was born in the Depression through the lens of, through his lens and not my own since I was born a generation later. Well, here's what I would have done. You know, like, you can't be doing that. You have to be able to write it the right way. The second issue that I had with Henry was that I was born in Boston and he was born in Mobile. So you can't be a northerner coming down there and expecting people to talk to you and trust you. You had to do a great deal of listening. You had to be able to talk about his story on his terms. And then, of course, the third piece of the story was... You know, when Henry Aaron retired in 1976, I was seven years old. So I didn't really have any institutional memory with Henry. I never saw him move, never saw him play, never never felt him in the zeitgeist, like the everyday of having the great Hank Aaron playing in your world. But, you know, those are really important things. And obviously they're not debilitating, they're not disqualifying because, I mean, hell, people, there's a new book on Abraham Lincoln every every year and he's been dead 150 years. So it's not as though you had to have those things, but those were important to me. With Ricky, it was different. I covered Ricky. I covered Ricky in his last year with the A's in 1998. I saw Ricky play. I started my career in Oakland. I had some familiarity with the subject. But in Ricky's case, to your point, the I have viewed all of my books, not all of them, but most of the books, as part of a certain continuum of the 20th century in sports, especially for black people. And it goes in three phases, really. You know, the first stage is the immigrant story. And that is you go from the Industrial Revolution, you have the old world becoming, you know, the new world with with European immigration. And you think about that generation from the late 1800s into the 19th, into the 20th century, into the 1900s, where the children of the immigrants became Americanized through sports whether it was, you know, Lou Gehrig or Babe Ruth and, you know, the Irish, the Italians, the Poles, the Jews, you know, through boxing, through football, through baseball, especially. And then there's the second, there's the second era, you know, the second stage, which is the the integration era, which is where black people begin to integrate the society, and they do it through sports. People don't talk about this nearly as much as they used to. But, you know, baseball is the first major American institution to integrate. You know, it integrated before schools, it integrated before the military, it integrated before corporate America, it integrated before government in a lot of ways, in a large sense. And so, and that's why you have your civil rights movement stories. It's why you have your Willie Mays and your Hank Aaron and your Jackie Robinson stories and your Joe Lewis's and the Jesse Owens is, etc. And then, of course, the third era is Ricky's time, is the free agent era, the economic era, the money era, where these guys become individual corporations in a way, where they start making real money, where they now have free agency and they can advocate for themselves. And now the relationship between the black player and the public is different. Instead of being homegrown and going through your, your, the team that signed you, the team that drafts you, now you can sign for big money and now you're the, you know, you're the face of an organization that didn't raise you. And what did that do for the, the, you know, the white paying customer now having to look at these big money black athletes advocating for themselves and talking about what they're worth and what they deserve and, and all of those things. And I've wanted to talk about this third piece of it for years, but a lot of publishers weren't interested because they didn't think it was a heroic story. They didn't think pub- that the public was really that interested because they get so turned off by money and that the players are spoiled and all the things that we talk about. And I just couldn't have disagreed with that more because one thing that we do know is we know that people are obsessed with money. People love reading about money. People care about money. They're always interested in, in the money story. The money story is the story of America. And Ricky is absolutely that guy who was like, hey, I'm worth whatever you're willing to pay me, and I want my money. I'm not comparing myself to the electrician or the plumber, and I'm not going to apologize for saying I'm worth a million dollars. Because if you're, you know, 
Don't compare me to the guy who works at a bakery. Compare me to the other guy in center field who's making more money than me. And the public hated that. I mean, you have to go back to the time period, which is why this is such an interesting era for me. I mean, people don't even blink today that a guy's making $80 million or that Juan Soto turned down $400 million or that LeBron just signed a $97 million extension. Guys back then were losing their minds that players were making $200,000, $300,000, $400,000. And so in 1979, when Ricky comes up, he's making $17,000. By 1982, he's making $535,000, and he's pissed off about it, and the public is like, who is this guy? And he's like, I want my money. If the guy next to me is making six hundred, I'm better than him. And the public really did not like that. And they certainly didn't like that now that the public has to. And you saw it with Reggie Jackson and you saw it with Dave Winfield. And there were other guys before Ricky. But it's all during that same time period, the first decade of free agency, where these athletes, black, white, Latino, whomever, they now have the right to have their services bid for. And people didn't complain when the suits were making a ton of money. But the minute the worker starts making money, now everybody's mad. You know, to that end, I know that we're talking, you know, of course, you wrote you wrote this story about Rick Anderson in the context of, of baseball. But there, again, like there is this broader experience. What advice, if you have any, uh, would you give to this newest era of worker, particularly black and brown folks who are in these spaces and they're looking to to get what they're worth, but they're told to, hey, be grateful for what you got. Be happy for that. You're making more than your your parents made. You should just be happy with that. Yeah, no doubt. And I, I think that what's been interesting about that is sports makes it easy. Because in sports, they list everybody's salary. They announce people's salaries. So when you know, when Fernando Tatis signs a 14-year, $340 million contract, all of his peers know he's making $340 million. And they know the breakdown of the contract, and they know the incentives in the contract, and they know every detail about that deal. But when you're sitting in the lunchroom, employers don't want anyone to know what anybody else is making. That's why there's a great movement taking place right now both you know, pro and con, should employees share salary? Should they share salary information? And is that better? Is that pro worker or does that hurt workers? Because imagine the sticker shock when you find out you're making demonstrably less or demonstrably more than your coworkers, or you're all making nothing, comparatively speaking, to other companies. And so that that information has always been really proprietary, both from a corporate standpoint and from an employee standpoint. You know, what's it like walking around the newsroom or walking around your office knowing you do the same job and you're making forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars less than the person next to you? I mean, we deal with that all the time when it comes to athletes because that's our cotton candy, that's our playtime. But when it's us. I mean, think about that. And then you'll have guys like people are like, oh, well, it's not about the money or how can you make that kind of money or how can you complain about that? If I made that much money, you'd never hear me complain. Bullshit. You would absolutely be complaining if the dude next to you was making more than that. And so the issue to me has always been um, my advice is I don't know. Sometimes I really do feel like we should all know what each other, what each other is making. Um, and it's, I don't think about it from a selfish standpoint. I just think, it, think about it from a philosophical standpoint. What is, where is the greater good? Is there more harm than good? Is, is this a positive thing for employees? Part of me thinks absolutely it is. Um, most of me thinks that it is. And I mean, I, I, and, and obviously at a place like ESPN, which is a really, really weird place. Like ESPN has no rules. Like I used to, you know, we, I remember being around people who were always upset about what everybody was making at ESPN. And I was like, how are you going to get mad at a place? How are you going to keep score at a place that has no rules? And what I mean by not having any rules is ESPN is like an airline. Nobody paid the same price for their seat, right? You might be sitting in the same row, but you didn't pay the same price depending on when you bought your ticket. 
And what I mean by that is at ESPN, you have all these people coming in from all these different walks of life who may be doing the same job as you, but they've got different values. Like I remember one time when, you know, when I came in and I was doing a show and I'm sitting there, you know, next to Dave Winfield. Of course, Dave Winfield is going to be making more money than me. He's Dave Winfield, right? I mean, so, you know, I'm walking in the hallway. There's there's Bill Walton. I remember walking into the newsroom one day at ESPN and Jerry Rice was sitting at a computer. So it's like, how am I going to complain? I should be making with Jerry Rice. I'm not Jerry Rice, right? Now he, you know, and so that's what I mean about the the different variables that come to ESPN is obviously an extreme place because it's a celebrity driven place and it has so many famous people working there. Obviously, you know, how, whatever your calculation is, you cannot assume that's the same as working in a regular corporate office because the ESPN dynamic is so different. But the point remains, how do we determine what people are making and what they're making when they come in? Their, their piece, you know, their moment is different from your moment. Like, for example, you may come into a job situation at that time and you're entry level. And now you sort of work your way up or you've got seniority or you've been there for X amount of years, but you've been working for the same place. And those places, once you stay there, are never going to pay you market value because they've never had to. Now you're working side by side with somebody who's already been in the market and suppose the company had to compete with them you know, had to compete with two other places to hire them. So, of course, they had to go up a little bit more in salary. So not knowing all those dynamics, now you're pissed off because the person next to you is making $35,000 more than you, but the situations are different. So I, I do feel like that's a, um, you know, it's a really interesting place to be. And that's why sports is so interesting, because in sports, all that stuff is public. Everybody knows what everybody's making. It's interesting. So I'd be remiss. Like now, how are you? No, I listen, man. I reckon you're the you're one of you are one of, if not the most prolific sports journalists in the world. So I got to ask you the question. Lamar Jackson has been coming up. You know, we've been talking about contract talks. Uh, he continues to be uh, a, a talking point in the media. I think people love talk. People know that he gets attention. So, of course, all the big media is going to talk about him. I have a couple of questions for you about Lamar, but first I want to, I'd like to Lance just level set with what's your perspective on him as a quarterback and a player in the NFL? Well, I'm not a huge NFL guy anymore because I'm, I have fundamental issues watching 22 predominantly black men smash into each other for a living. Respect. For my entertainment at the expense of their brains. So the game's not as enjoyable for me anymore, sadly to say, because I used to love, love, love football. But as you get older and you see there's something about that sport I don't feel comfortable watching anymore. But if you just want to talk football, we can talk football. Lamar Jackson's a winner. He's a, he's a winning impact player. And I think that it, Lamar Jackson reminds me of when I cover baseball in that when you talk to scouts in baseball, in fact, when you talk to scouts anywhere because they're scouts, they're grizzly, you know, they're crusty, it's the nature of their business. All they do is concentrate on what you can't do because their job is evaluation. When people talk about Lamar Jackson, they spend so much time talking about what he's not. And in some ways, Lamar Jackson has never recovered from all the talk of trying to convert him from quarterback when he first came into the league. The man won the MVP. And the conversation about him is still all that he's not. Or what's going to happen when he faces a major injury and he can't use his legs anymore. Now he's going to read defenses. And, you know, that sort of sidearm weird throw is not textbook and whatever. And so to me, I just look at it this way. Is your team a better team with or without Lamar Jackson? When Lamar Jackson is on your team, do people want to watch Lamar Jackson? The answer to both questions is an overwhelming yes. When he's there, people watch him. He does electric stuff. He wins football games. He finds ways to make his teammates better. Is he a classic drop back quarterback that's scanning the offense and hitting his fourth read? Not always. But the Baltimore Ravens winning percentage with Lamar Jackson is playoff level every year. And 
if you want to compare him to Josh Allen, okay, fine, compare him to Josh Allen. But you don't have Josh Allen either. <laughs> if you don't have Lamar Jackson. <laughs> you know, you want to yeah. compare him to Pat Mahomes, fine, but he's not on your team either. So <laughs> the evaluation of so many of these players is always rooted so often in the optics of what they cannot do. When the bottom line is Lamar Jackson is a great player. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the challenge I would like for me is like, I just been noticing, I'm not going to say a bunch of names, but I just been noticing like there, there's also like these driving narratives that don't actually align with his performance. Right. So like the idea of like, okay, well, he doesn't really throw outside the well outside the net. Like all of his, all of his passing statistics are actually like top five, top three. And or he 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 he's a one read guy, or he he takes off and runs with it. It's like it's almost like they hyperimpose Michael Vick takes on Lamar Jackson. And I'm like, bro, I just got done watching that Colts, uh, looking at the highlights of that Colts game. Of, I'm sorry, every passing play he had of that Colts game, he threw four and some yards. I'm just like, I'm like, hey, like this, and he's sitting in the pocket. Frankly, there were moments where he should have been running. So I think for me, it's I'm I'm curious, um, you know. There seems to be also Steve Young recently came out and said, look, the Ravens organization is holding Lamar back. They're not giving him the resources and things that he needs uh, to be successful. Um, And the response there was, hey, look, Steve Young, we love him, but no, no, he's wrong. Lamar needs to be grateful for what he has. What do you think the driving narrative is of, you know, to your point, like the what do you think the driving narrative is it as simple as folks just don't want Lamar to get his money? Or is there something else that I'm missing? No, I think what it is, I think it's two things. And maybe three, Mm. but certainly two. The first thing that it is, it's the optics of the quarterback himself. Right? Lamar Jackson does not look like a classic quarterback. And because he doesn't look the part, people keep waiting for the moment where he's not going to be the part. But it hasn't happened. Because he keeps balling. He keeps playing. He keeps doing what Lamar Jackson does. And so there's that. So there's the, oh, this thing can't possibly last type of thing with Lamar Jackson. That once the league figures him out, now we'll see. How long has Lamar Jackson been in the league? Right? This is what he is. And this is what they are. Right? But this goes back to the idea of what we think we know what we're watching. You could say the same thing about Barry Sanders. Well, at some point, someone, you know, the league is going to recognize that he's going to come hit the line and then he's going to bounce outside and you'll be there waiting. Except you couldn't catch him. (laughs) Right? You knew what he was going to do and he knew what he was going to do, but what he did was quicker than what you were trying to stop him. You know, the the things that you were trying to do to stop him. You, You see, you know, people were saying the same thing about Russell Wilson. Oh, well, you know, that making something out of nothing stuff eventually is going to catch up to him and in some ways you know the biggest thing about russell wilson was just the number of hits he took they never figured out russell wilson he just took too many hits and eventually that team declined and that was that but all of these the different dynamics in waiting for the unorthodox guy to be exposed lamar jackson really suffers a lot from that And also, as I was saying earlier, he suffers from the fact that deep down, the level of negativity that he could not succeed has always haunted him. That's the first thing. The second thing is, the critics aren't wrong about one thing. Hmm. And that is, the statistics would suggest, just statistically odds-wise, since we're all into gambling now, let's just talk about the odds. The odds of Lamar Jackson's style of play getting him hurt are actually pretty high. He's out in the open. He takes hits. He's kind of unprotected. And I think people are sort of waiting on the clock. So it's not like you can't give him his money. It's that the minute you give him his money is going to be the day he gets hurt because of his style of play, which is completely unfair to him, which is why the Lamar Jackson of the world need to get their money fast and up front because people are essentially going to use your style of play as justification for not paying you because it's not a a long-term it's it's not the type of long-term style that you think is going to benefit you like for example the minute you pay him and he does get hurt can lamar jackson still succeed 
the answer to me is, sure he can. I mean, there are guys that we've heard that about. Used to hear it about Steve Young. Oh, well, you know, he takes off and runs immediately. Steve Young's in the Hall of Fame. Right. <laughs> and why is Steve Young in the Hall of Fame? Because Steve Young adjusted as his, as his career moved on, and he became more of a pocket passer and was one of the highest rated passers in history. And he's connected on 70% of his passes. We saw it with Randall Cunningham. Oh, well, you know, the minute Randall gets out of the pocket and he runs, he, you know, he can't. Then, then he comes back in 1998 and has one of the great seasons of all time as a drop back passer. We saw the same thing with John Elway. We saw the same thing in a lot of ways, you know, with a lot of different quarterbacks. We saw it with Michael Vick when Michael Vick got out of prison. All of a sudden, Michael Vick was more of a drop back passer and he was fine. So these things don't really have a great deal of merit unless you believe that Lamar Jackson's IQ as a football player is simply not high enough for him to adjust to potential injury, which I think is nonsense. And then, of course, that brings us to the third thing, which is people just still don't respect black quarterbacks. They still just, there's something about a black quarterback that you still sort of see as a running back. That there's just that thing. And, and, and if people get upset about it, well, too bad for them, because the last thing I would do is put the NFL above being racist <laughs> because we know the NFL is very, very good at being racist because they have so much daily practice at it. And if you don't believe me, just go read the race norming settlements, look at their coaching track records, look at all of it. So all of the above, all three things make for a perfect storm when you're talking about Lamar Jackson. Howard, look, we appreciate you. Uh, thank you for being a guest. This is your third time on the show. Appreciate you giving uh, independent black media a shot and uh, and being so supportive. I know you got a lot of stuff going on, so we'll let you get to it, man. Yeah, my pleasure, Zach, and thank you. I apologize for the unstable connection. Next time, uh, we'll talk when I'm at home. I'm sitting in a hotel room right now. Hey, man, take, stay safe out there now with that Rona monkeypox now. Come on now. <laughs> catch up later man peace <laughs> and we're back yo um shout out again to howard bryant shout out to howard bryant's latest book the book's name is ricky the life and legend of an american original phenomenal read of course as you know if you know anything about howard bryant he's been um, one of the great profilers of like not just of like baseball legends, but black baseball legends. And so I really appreciated his historical approach to Ricky's story and his impact. And even if you're not a baseball, like deep baseball fan, there's so much to take away from the book. And so I, I genuinely encourage you, if you're listening to this, to click the link in the show notes, check out the book and bless yourself. Like straight up, there's some incredible, incredible excerpts in there like but this is a great book. It's a great, it's a great journey, very educational and affirming in a lot of ways and challenging too. You know, I also want to really remind everybody that you know, your value is a real thing, right? Sometimes we talk about advocating for yourself or kind of like standing up for your value as if your value is like this amorphous, debatable thing. But there's a quantitative number around your value and there is objective fact around your value now it's up to you to determine how you find that out but don't deceive yourself in thinking that you don't carry value first of all you carry value as a person off top and certainly in these corporate spaces you have value okay and it's not arrogant or anything else to sit in your value right shout out to tabitha brown there is nothing wrong with you being clear about your value, demanding your value and standing firm in your values. You know what I'm saying? This space in this world, just really, I'm going to speak to just a corporate America. I'm not going to speak to every piece of the workforce around the world. Corporate America has this really sick way of like shaming the worker, right? Anything that isn't and explicit and frankly one-way benefit to the employer is somehow bad. I'm really excited about this new generation and era of folks coming and maybe it's because of social media and just like the spread of information 
and just education and awareness. But we got to continue to reject any narrative that would make us feel less than or that would make us want to prop up corporate institutions over individuals. Right. Like the worker is what matters. The worker is what keeps everything going. The worker is the most critical thing. And these institutions um, are continuing to grow anxious and scared and nervous because they're seeing the reading between the tea leaves that their grip on power is in question. But your value is not in question. Your ability to deliver whatever it is you deliver at your job, whatever it is that you're good at, don't question that, right? If you want to continue to grow and develop, go for that. You should, but don't discount yourself for real. You have value, all right? With that being said, I appreciate you. I love you. Take care of yourself. This has been Zach with Living Corporate. Again, shout out to Howard Bryant. Peace. Living Corporate is a podcast by Living Corporate LLC. Our logo was designed by David Dawkins. Our theme music was produced by Ken Brown. Additional music production by Antoine Franklin for Musical Elevation. Post-production is handled by Jeremy Jackson. Got a topic suggestion? Email us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and living-corporate.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned. This episode of Living Corporate is brought to you by Blind. Blind is a safe, trusted community of more than 5 million verified professionals. Head over to teamblind.com to get the latest insights into salaries, company reviews, and interview experiences at thousands of companies worldwide.